So how's the case coming? Okay, I'm glad I don't hear what case, right? So then I'd be in trouble, so. Okay, so I left you on Wednesday with this question of should you hedge, right? And the answer was not categorical. It depends on what you're hedging. I said you should be more likely to hedge input costs than output for the simple reason that if I'm investing in an oil company, I'm investing, I'm making a bet on oil price, I don't want you to undercut me. You should be more likely to hedge if you're a company with investors who are domestic investors than international investors simply because international investors can take care of themselves. You should be more likely to hedge if you're a private company than if you're a public company. But you can see how one lesson is not going to fit all. So if I ask you, if I, so the first question you need to ask is do I need to hedge as a company? You don't take it as a given that just because everybody else hedges, you should as well. Any questions on the hedging question? Because I think that's kind of a fundamental question that all corporations face, and if they're not careful, they take the sloppy answer out. Yeah. No, no, but you can have, let's say everybody hedge only input. You think people selling hedges or are, are selling futures are actually people like, because most people who trade futures have not, no, no position in the commodity. There's, there are enough speculators in the game who think they can call prices that the liquidity is going to exist. So let's face it, 10% of actual trading in derivatives on commodities comes from people actually wanting to hedge. 90% comes from people betting on prices. So don't worry, even if everybody who hedges oil stops hedging, oil futures will not go away. There are enough people who think they know more than they do for this market to exist without anybody doing any real stuff in the market. So if all you had were people with commodity taking positions, you're right, but that's not the case. This is a market that's very deep with investors who think they know where the dire what the direction is going to be for a commodity. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so let's kind of, oh, I'm sorry. So now let's move on to a different kind of investment. Remember early in this process when we started talking about investments, I said everything is an investment. So we've looked at a Disney theme park, big infrastructure investment. We've looked at a Vale iron ore mine, investment but a relatively small one because the company does dozens of these every year. So I'm going to move on to a very big investment. And for whatever reason, in the real world, people don't seem to think of it as an investment. An acquisition is a gigantic investment. Disney's biggest investment in, the last, in its entire lifetime happened last year when they bought Fox for $71 billion. The, no investment they've ever made. I mean, they bought Lucasfilms for $4 billion. They bought Marvel for $4 billion. This is a $71 billion investment. And I'm going to bring in everything we've said about traditional projects to investing. Why should they have their own set of rules? With traditional projects, we said to take an investment, what do you need? You need a positive net present value. If you're looking at accounting return, I said your return on capital is to exceed the cost of capital. Why would that be different if you're looking at an acquisition? When you do an acquisition, your net present value of the investment has to be positive, which means if you're a Disney investor, what are you hoping and praying Disney did before they paid 71 billion? That they projected the cash flows on Fox, and you're allowed to add on synergy. You can add on all that neat stuff you think will happen into the cash flows, and that they discounted those cash flows back. When we talked about a project, what do we say the discount rate should be based on? The risk of the project, not the risk of, that they based the discount rate on Fox's characteristics, and they got the present value of the cash flows, and they got a number greater than? net present value greater than zero, but a present value greater than 71 billion, do you think they actually did this? There's not a chance that they actually did this. And this is what I think the problem with acquisitions is. You have all these rules for small projects. 
I'm sure a theme park investment has to jump through all kinds of hoops. But then you do a $71 billion acquisition and all bets are off. So let's take an acquisition to see how the capital budgeting process will play out. I'm going to make up an acquisition here. Harman Audio makes high-end audio systems. Tata Motors makes cars. And as we all know, people want their cars to have high-end audio systems now. So in this acquisition, here's what Tata Motors is going to do. It's going to acquire Harman Audio to get access to that sound technology that they can put into the cars. So, and they talk about synergy and all the rest of the stuff. Let's take that all into, pro into the process, but first let's value Harman Audio. So you're Tata Motors, you're valuing uh, Harman Audio, you have to make some choices. Let's assume you decide to value Harman Audio in US dollars. See why I said decide, it's, it is a US company, you're saying what choice do I have? I said currency is always a choice. You can look at any project, any acquisition, any currency. They could have valued Harman Audio in rupees if they wanted, and if they did this right, should get the same value. But because all the numbers are in dollars, they've decided to do the valuation in US dollars. How does that play out? Well, I need to come up with a cost of equity and a cost of capital in US dollar terms. To get the cost of equity, here's what I used. I looked at the beta for electronic companies. You're saying, but Tata Motors is an automobile company. Why am I not using the auto company beta? It's a capital budgeting decision. Remember, the, the, pro, the discount rate for a project should reflect what business the project is in. So I looked at electronic company betas, and I got a beta 1.17, non-levered beta. For the equity risk premium, I looked at where Harman Audio got its revenues, not where Tata Motors. See how your perspective has to be entirely through the eyes of a target company? Your beta comes from the business they're in. Your equity risk premium comes from where they do business. And for the cost of debt and the debt ratio, I assumed that what Harman Audio has debt was what they could afford to take on. And they had a debt ratio of about 8%. 92% equity. Why so low? They're an electronics company. Their cash flows are risky. Standing alone, they probably couldn't borrow more. And I use their cost of debt. I get a cost of capital for Harman Audio. Let me pause and throw a what if at you. What if Tata Motors had borrowed 80% of the money for this acquisition? Do you see where I'm going to go next? Can I use an 80% debt ratio in there and come up with the cost of capital? People do this all the time in acquisitions. They say, well, I borrowed 80% to do the acquisition. Why can I not use that 80% debt ratio? Why should I not use that 80% debt ratio? What will happen if I use an 80% debt ratio to the cost of capital? It's going to fall really low. Then if I use a really low cost of capital, I'm going to get a really high value for, for Harman Audio. Let's carry this to the next step. You pay that really high value. What have you just done? You've just taken something you've earned over a lifetime as a company, which is you have debt capacity, you have a really high rating, and you've given a premium to target company shareholders who had absolutely no role in creating it. Render unto the target company shareholders that which is theirs and not a penny more. So if you, in fact, I've actually seen target companies valued with a 100% debt ratio. And you see how the logic goes, right? Can a company borrow all the money it needs for an acquisition? Sure, if you're a big company valuing a target company and the target company is smaller, you could borrow all the money and then the false logic kicks in. If that's the way I'm funding the acquisition, I'm going to use 100% debt and we're a AAA rated company, that cost of debt is going to be about 2.8%. And if you multiply by one minus the tax rate, what's your cost of capital going to look like? 2%? The target company shareholders are dancing in the streets because of what you've done, but it makes no sense. So when you look at an acquisition, I can throw a curveball and say, the way the, the acquisition is funded is 90% debt, 10% equity. Ignore it. It has to be all about the target company and what it can borrow standing alone. I'll tell you one escape hatch where you might not use the target company's debt ratio. A little later in this class, we're going to talk about optimal debt ratios, which reflects what a company can afford to borrow. Let's assume that Harman Audio could have borrowed 20% as a standalone company, and that was their optimal debt ratio. Then is it okay to use the 20%? Yeah, because you now run the company, you can change the debt ratio. You're saying, but then I'm using my, no, you're still using Harman Audio to come up with the optimal debt ratio, but it should all be about the target company. 
So I end up with a cost to capital for Harman Audio of 9.67%, reflecting what kind of business they're in, where they do business, and what their debt choices are. Any questions on that? Now let's talk about cash flows. How did I get the cash flows for a theme park? I started with after-tax operating income, and then I added back depreciation, subtracted capex, subtracted change in working capital. That's how you compute the cash flow for a project. Why is an acquisition any different? To get the cash flow on Harman Audio as a standalone company, I start with the operating income. And here it's a little messier because you're getting the operating income for an entire company. I add back depreciation. But here, if you're going concern, you're going to have to reinvest back, not just to maintain the company, but if I'm expecting growth, you have to reinvest enough to sustain the growth. It's the same process, but now you're buying a company, not a project. You see the difference? I'll give you a very simple example to illustrate the difference. Let's say you're a pharmaceutical company, and you have a drug, and you sell the drug. How would I value the drug? I'd take the life of the drug, I'd take the cash flows, and if it's an 18-year patent, I'll project the cash flows for 18 years, discount them back, come up with the value today, and that's what I'd pay you. So if I bought a drug, I'm valuing it as a capital budgeting project, a finite life project, I get the cash flows, a value. But if I buy the entire company, I'm getting the drug plus your R&D department, which might be a great R&D, average R&D. So basically, this is a going concern with other stuff that might or might not come. So when you value a company, the game gets a little bigger because now you've got to think about what the company might do in the future. So here's how I completed the process. I got the reinvestment by looking at what the company did last year. And when I do that, I'm already making an assumption about the future, right? Which is if this is what it did last year, this is what I expect it to do in the future. And that's a leap of faith because companies can change their minds. But in this case, I'm going to keep the assumption that what the company did last year was the sensible thing. They were reinvesting just enough. I put in a growth rate of 2.75% in perpetuity. Remember for Disney, I waited till year 10 to do this? You don't have to wait till year 10 to do this if your company is already in steady state, or if you have a project that's going to go hit the ground running and have 2% growth forever, you don't have to do 10 years of cash flows. It's, it's not going to change your net present value. Might as well, that equation is just a generic equation to capture the present value of cash flows once they've settled into steady state. And if I make the assumption that there's going to be a 2.75% growth rate, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to project out the cash flows next year. That's always part of present value. When we did the Disney theme park, to get the terminal value in year 10, I projected out the cash flows in year 11. So I projected out the cash flows. And I'm going to assume that I'm going to reinvest enough to get that 2.75% growth rate the cash flows you're going to see for my valuation are going to reflect my expectations of how much they will have to reinvest to sustain that 2.75% growth rate. Same process as with the theme park, but it's messier because I've got to think about the company, the growth rate, what it's investing at. And that's basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the cash flow next year, 166.85. And because I was careful about putting in enough reinvestment, that cash flow is self-sustaining, and I'm going to divided by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate. That's the perpetuity growth equation. It's not a valuation equation. It's a math equation for an infinite series. So people can call it the Gordon growth model. They can call it whatever they want. But we stole it from mathematics, and we act like we invented this. What I get as my value for the operating assets is $2,476 million. Now, if you're doing a project, you're done. This is it, right? But if you're doing a company, you're not quite done, and here's why. You valued the operating assets of the company because you used the operating income as your starting point. What have you not valued yet? Any asset that's not part of operating income. I don't want to be mysterious, but if I do this for Apple, and I come up with a value for the operating assets, what have I missed? $240 billion in cash. And I want to say that because people say, what's the big deal? Well, that's 240 billion you're missing. That's a big deal. So remember to add cash. And because you're buying the equity in a company, what's the last step? You've got to subtract out the debt. And what you get as a value for the equity is 2,678 million. As a standalone company, based on its risk characteristics, its growth projections, and its cash flows, Tata Motors should be paying 2,678 million for Harman Audio. 
they actually, let's say that the, uh, the market price was 5,428 million. And let's say they actually paid the market price. Your first reaction is, they're overpaying, right? I'm not going to be ready to pass a judgment yet because what have I not valued yet? Because they talked about synergies. So in a, in a few pages we'll talk, but at this stage in the process it doesn't look really good because there's gonna be a huge amount of synergy to tip this over the edge. But the starting point is you always want to value the target company as a standalone company. So if you did this for Disney, and you'd been on the team valuing Fox, you'd have valued Fox as a standalone company with everything it has in place today. Let's say you come up with 55 billion. You now have the extra step of how much is synergy worth? Now we control Hulu because we have a two-third share of Hulu. We used to be just one-third. Can that make the difference? So you go piece by piece with synergy and hope and pray that that extra synergy is going to take you an extra $16 billion up. Because if that's what you're willing to pay, $71 billion, you've got to get above that number. There is no escape hatch from net present value. Do you see why? Because you can talk about strategic considerations, synergy, China, whatever you want to do, and my job is to bring it into the cash flows. I'm not saying it's not worth anything, but I have to bring it into the cash flows. And that's not because I'm being prosaic and caring about cash flows. It's to, get, it's to discipline the process. Because if I don't have that discipline, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come up with a value of $55 billion. You tell me you're going to pay $71 billion. And I ask you, why are you paying the extra $16 billion? You're going to say synergy. It's just a word. And if I don't put numbers in the word, you can justify any deal. So that's why very early in the class I said there's no garnishing allowed in investment analysis. What I mean by garnishing is all that stuff you throw on to the table after I work through the numbers, I'm not going to let you get away with it. I'm going to try to bring it to the cash flows. I'm not going to say you're wrong. But I think it's going to make you better if you're a strategic consultant because it's going to make you think about what does this even mean. I think it makes everybody around the table think more seriously. And you know what the next step is? If you decide to put numbers for synergy, you have a plan. And if you have a plan, you can hold somebody accountable for delivering the plan. And here's my advice to you. There's some guy at Disney who's really pushing for this deal, right? He wants this deal to go through. He's jumping through hoops. He's telling you all these great stories. Here's what I would suggest. After you projected out the cash flows for Synergy, give him the cash flow and say, hey, you wanted this deal so much. Now you're responsible for delivering. You'll be amazed at how quickly projections start to come down when people realize that they actually have to deliver the numbers. So the first thing that happens in acquisitions is people throw buzzwords, and the second is there's no accountability. The people who do the deal walk away as heroes, and then somebody else has to come in and pick up all the pieces and try to deliver stuff that was promised. It's like trying to deliver a $35,000 Tesla 3, because Elon Musk said we could deliver it after you've actually come up with production, it's going to cost you $45,000. you are being asked to deliver the impossible because somebody promised the impossible at the time of the acquisition. I don't think it's fair that you lose your job. It should be the guy who made the promise who loses the job. And the only way we can get that is by making people plan for stuff before they do it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. That's actually a good question. The question was, by buying Fox, Disney actually bought an overlapping sports network with ESPN in some parts of the country. Now you've got a problem. You've got two things. There are neg so if you have negative consequences, it's all about cash flows, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to ask you what those negative consequences are. I have to sell off this, this, and this at a bargain basement price. I'm going to bring it into the cash flows. Okay, let's not go there, because then you're letting stupidity drive your decisions, because if somebody else will pay an even higher price, let them pay it. Let them dig their own grave and jump into it. Why are you stopping them? In fact, Comcast did exactly what they did because they knew Disney would think this way, right? Because if you're Comcast and you want to make Disney self-destruct, what are you going to do? You know they want to buy Fox, you're going to keep pushing up the bidding and hope and pray that they don't get good sense. Because then you might actually win this bidding. This is a bidding war you don't want to win. You want the other guy to win. 
just like Amazon pushed up the price of Flipkart until Walmart couldn't stop themselves. You're paying, what, $21 billion for a company that's not just losing money, but it's designed to never make money. It was never designed as a business. It was just designed as an exit strategy with somebody. And you know what? The Binney brothers who built it walked away with billions, so you can't complain that they did the wrong thing. But it's always nice to have that exit strategy. So if the argument in Disney is we don't do it, somebody else will, you know already that this acquisition is on any time that becomes your, pre, your basis is we are preempting a competitor, you're already in a really weak round in acquisitions, and you're going to end up overpaying. Now, if your worry is that Comcast will take you over and that might cause negative cash flows for you, you know what, I can bring that in. Because in a sense, if that's your argument is we become weaker, then we can work out the effect. It's all, I, I know it sounds like I'm going back to something very, very basic. But it's got to be in the cash flows or the risk, ultimately, for any story to prevail. So whatever story you have, I can bring that in as long as we start to develop that story. To, because, because often the story is the easy part. And then I ask you, well, how is it going to play out? Then it's something that we have to think through. And that's good for us to think it through. Because if you then base your decision, at least it's based on something tangible. Any other questions? Yes? We'll come back to that. Right? The question was, when I do cash flows and synergy, because when I valued Harmon, what did I use as my discount rate? The discount rate for Harmon. You can probably answer this already. If I project the cash flows from synergy, what discount rate should I apply to that? I'll give you the three choices. You can use the acquiring company's cost of capital. You can use the target company's cost of capital. Or you can use the combined company's cost of capital. Come on, you already know what to do. What should you use? Where does the synergy show up? Because you combine the companies, able to do something as a combined company it could not have. Which means you should have two discount rates rolling around, right? One for valuing the target company, and one for valuing the synergy. So any time you have synergies, it gets messier, because you're now talking about a weighted average. Okay? How much difference does it make? It depends on how different the risk is between the, if they're very close in risk, it probably doesn't matter that much but the acquiring company is very safe and the target company is very risky, then this can make a difference in what kind of discount rate you apply. So now let's mop up. So all this is about picking, pro you know, deciding whether to take a project or not. Let's talk about some of the things that can make this process more difficult. The first is, when I looked at the Disney theme park, I treated it as an independent project. Right? Cash flows in the project. And as you point out, the Harman Audio, when you take a big project as a company, there are side effects. Some are good, some are bad. In the case of Disney, when it builds a new theme park in Rio, the good side effects might be your movies do much better in Rio than they used to because now kids are going. So that might be a potential positive side effect. What's a negative? Well, if you open that Disney theme park in Rio, not everybody who's coming to the theme park is a new customer, right? What am I talking about? Well, you go to Orlando, take a look at the tourists in front of you, right? Maybe 20% are from Latin America. It's, you know, getting to Miami from Latin America is easier than getting within Latin America. At the, when the REI was really strong, there was a point in time where 25% of the tourists in front of you might have been Brazilian. Why were they coming? Because they wanted to go to Disney theme park. You build one in Rio, a few of them might still come to Orlando. But the, so the negative side effect is you might lose customers with other way. So this becomes a process. You say, well, that's going, I'm just going to ignore it. If you do, though, the, the danger is you're missing cash flows that should be brought in. So I want to talk about what happens when you first have independent project, which is the easiest scenario, and then what happens if you have to choose? Choose between projects. Either because they're mutually exclusive. You know what I mean by mutually exclusive project? You have a huge headquarters building. You're trying to pick a new heating system. You think that's an investment? Everything's an investment. You can pick system A or system B. You're not going to pick both, I hope. If you pick one, you can't pick the other. We'll start with mutually exclusive investments, and then we look at interdependent investments, because that's where the messiness begins. 
So let's start with mutually exclusive investments. If you take an investment, then you can't take other investments. So if you have five different ways of doing something, if you pick one, the other four. In fact, this can be big decisions. You as a company are trying to decide whether you want to expand only into China or expand into all of Asia, right? So, that's a, so you can have mutually exclusive decisions which are, in fact, leading to huge consequences. Now, we talked about two different ways of picking projects, right? NPV or IRR. And we said if an NPV is positive, you should pick the project. If it's negative, you should reject the project. The IRR is greater than the cost of capital. That's for independent projects. That's, that's where you start. But if you have mutually exclusive projects, you see what your problem is going to be? You have two projects. You have to decide which one is better. They both, both might have high net present values greater than zero. You can't pick both. You think that's going to be easy. I'll pick the one with a higher NPV. Yeah, that might work if the first project is a five-year life and the second project also has a five-year life. But if the pr first project has a 15-year life and the second project is a five-year life, you see why it gets messier? Remember, NPV is a dollar value. A longer project might have a higher NPV. It doesn't make it a better project. So we're going to talk about choosing between projects. And we're going to look at NPV and IRR and why sometimes your choices might be different depending on which approach you use. So let's start at the very, so as you look, as you look at these mutually exclusive projects, you can do the NPV of each one, the IRR of each one. If you use the NPV rule, you're going to pick the project with a higher NPV. And if you use the IRR rule, you're going to pick the one with a higher internal rate of return. You're saying, won't the two give the same answers? You can already see why they might not, right? Why? NPV is a dollar value, IRR is a percentage number. If I look at a percentage number, I'm going to bias myself towards smaller projects over larger projects. We talked about this in the last class as well. So I'm going to go through NPV versus IRR, but I'm going to spend only about 15 minutes on it. Why? Because when I took corporate finance, we spent like five sessions on NPV versus IRR, which is a huge waste of time. And here's why. 95% of the time, NPV and IRR give you the same decision. And if you adopt a time-weighted cash flow approach, I've already won the game, right? Even if you take IRR. It's better than using return invested capital. So why make this about, is NPV better than IRR? But let's talk about the differences. Let me show you a project. It's a very simple project. In fact, two projects. You know, first project has a four-year life. The second project has a four-year life. So they both have the same life. I give you the cash flows on the two projects. The first project has a strange cash flow pattern. You spend money up front, then you have three years of positive cash flows, then you have a negative cash flow there. Think of it as a licensing agreement where you have to make payments at both ends of the spectrum. The second project is a much more conventional project. You have a negative cash flow and positive cash flows thereafter. Now, if I compute the NPV of the two projects, I'll get a unique NPV. But remember that NPV profile that I talked about. I drew the NPV profile for both these projects. Basically, I'm taking the cash flows and trying different discount rates. Remember the definition of IRR? The IRR is that point at which your NPV profile crosses the x-axis. Now, project two, that happens around between 10 and 12%. But on project one, notice it crosses the x-axis twice, which means you have two different internal rates of return for this project. Why is that happening? Why do I have two internal rates of return for project one? An internal rate of return, we don't think of it as a, it's just a route to a mathematical equation. We use IRR functions in Excel. We, use, uh, you know, we might use you know, trial and error, but it's a route to an equation. You thought you'd left math behind, but it tracks you down. Every time you have a cash flow sign change, there's another route to the equation. So on project two, how many times does the cash flow change? Just once. You go from negative to positive, you're done. One cash flow sign change, one internal rate of return. On project two, you have two sign changes. You have two, you're saying, that's because you made up this second project. How many real projects do you have more than one cash flow check? You have a long-term project. Let's say it's a 30-year project. And every 10 years, you have to come in and redo the, the manufacturing facilities. Guess what? You're going to get a negative cash flow in year 10 and a negative cash flow in year 20. You're going to get three sign changes and three potential internal rates of return. Have you ever wondered how in Excel, when you ask for an IRR for a project, 
and it has more than one sign change how Excel actually decides which one to show you? It seems to pick. In the old, before Excel got updated, I don't know how they do it now, they would ask you to guess a discount rate. It is one of the inputs. And so IRR, you'd say, these are the cash flows. And my guess, you say, why are you asking me to guess? If I'm asking you to find out, do you know why they make you guess? Because then it's your fault. <laughs> because in this case, for instance, it turns out that there are two IRRs, one at 6.6% .6 and one at 36.55%. And which one will it show you? The one closer to your guess. And if you made a big deal, say, you guessed 10%. I just gave you the number closer to it. Your fault. If you'd guessed 30%, I'd have shown you the other number. It's very, very, I think, underhanded to do it this way. But this way, Excel is saying, not my fault, it's your fault. But in this case, there are two internal rates of return. Most of the time, you get lucky. It turns out that some of these roots are so outlandishly high or outlandishly negative that it doesn't even. But if you get numbers that both potentially could be viable numbers, you have a problem. Do you see what the problem is? Let's say your cost of capital is 12%. Which of these two projects should you accept? It's actually an easy way to answer the question if I showed you the graph, the previous graph, but I'm not going to show you. If I just showed you the IRRs, you see why your problem is going to be, hey, if I take the 36% plus, it looks like a good project. If I take the 6.6%, .6%, it looks like a bad project. So how do you break the tie? Go back and look at the profile. What's your cost of capital? 12%, and at 12%, if you look, the net present value is positive. There are entire books that have been written on what happens when you have multiple internal rates of return. These books should be one sentence. When you have multiple internal rates of return, just use the NPV. End of the book. Because there's no point jumping around here. When you have more than one IRR, it becomes very difficult to use it. So what do you do? You just go compute the net present value at that discount rate because there can be only one NPV. And if you look at the NPV, that net present value will tell you what to do. And in this case, if you look at that discount rate of 12%, you're getting a decision rule that you can then use on these projects. So you can compute the NPV of both projects. Pick the one at the higher NPV. So if you have more than one IRR, that's the easiest solution. Just abandon IRR. It is an approach that can give you more than one internal rate of return. So every time you have a cash flow sign change, you're going to... Don't be thinking about your case. I know some of you are already wondering, did we have more than one case? Let it go. This is not what your case is going to ride on. In fact, I didn't even ask you to compute an IRR for your project. You know why? Because this is exactly the kind of mind-numbing exercise you can get into with IRRs. What is the IRR? I want to decide whether to take the project or not. And the IRR becomes a distraction near multiple. I'll give you a story of how this can play out. I, you know, if, a couple of years ago, I get a student who went to work for a private equity fund. And the private equity fund raised money from wealthy investors, invest the money, and would return cash and get cash and return. So this particular investor kept bringing in cash and taking out cash and bringing in cash and taking out cash. And he was just trying to compute over the last two years, what kind of return have we made for this investor? So he was trying to compute an IRR because he had the cash in and the cash out. And there were 37 sign changes. And he was struggling. So he called me and said, what do I do? I said, I'll give you cheating ways you can do it. Here's one cheating way. Take all your negative cash flows and move them to the front. Take all your positive cash flows and move them to the end. Make it look like you have a big negative cash flow. You know why it's cheating, right? To bring your negative cash flows back to the front, what do I need to do? I need to have a discount rate. And to take your positive cash flow, so you're cheating, but you use a discount rate, you move them and say, oh, your IRR was 31 point It's a complete lie. That's really not your IR, but you're trying to get around these models. So this is more common than it looks, especially in the game of investing, because you can have inflows and outflows that cause these sign changes. Let's move to a second example, much more conventional example. You have two projects, mutually exclusive. If you take one, you can't take the other. The first project is a million dollar investment. The second project is a $10 million investment. File that away, that's their big difference. They both last four years and they both have cash flows. So I compute the NPV and the RR for both projects. So the NPV for project one is 467,000. The NPV for project two is 1.358 million. 
So based on NPV, project 2 is much better than project 1, or project B is better than project A. The IRR for project, one, though, for project A, though, is 33.66%. The IRR for project B is 20.88%. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by asking you why are the rankings different. Why are the rankings different? I'll insult your intelligence anyway, because I'm sure you get the right answer. It's because the first project is small, the second project is big. And if you look at a percentage return, it's far easier to make a 100% return on a $1 investment than it is on a billion dollar investment. So the answer is obvious. NPV is going to bias you towards bigger projects. IRR is going to bias you towards smaller projects. But remember, it's mutually exclusive here, right? So how many of you, given those numbers, would pick project A? So I'll, show, I'll give you the two choice again. How many of you would pick the higher IRR? Okay. And if you did, I'm going to put you on the spot. Let's say you pick project one because it is a higher IRR. What's your nightmare scenario? Let's say your capital budget is 20 million and you want to nurture it and use it on many projects. So you took the first project because you wanted to get the most bang for your buck. So you invested in the higher IRR. What's your biggest nightmare scenario? That, in other words, there are no other projects. So you could be waiting the rest of the saying, oh my God, I wish I'd taken the $10 million project. So when you use IRR, your biggest concern is your projects might be drying up and you might not get it. And if you take NPV and use project B, what's your biggest worry? Is you get this incredible project that requires $15 million as an investment, but you used up 10 of your 20 million, now you can't take that. Do you see how you're, con neither approach is risk-free. They both come with worries. The question is, what are you worried about? Are you more worried about projects coming in and not having capital to cover them? Are you more worried about having a lot of capital and not having enough projects? So if you ask me which approach is better for me, do you see what my answer is going to depend on? First, it's going to depend on whether you're a small or a large company. Second, it's going to depend on are you in a great business or an average business. And third, it's going to depend on how much access to capital do you have. Because if you can go to markets and raise money whenever you have a great project, guess what? You're going to be tilted towards NPV. Why? Because if you take a really big project and that other great project comes along, you're not stuck. You can still go raise money. When I took my, corporate finance, my, my first corporate finance class, the end result of this class was actually very rigid. We were told NPV is the best decision rule. Companies that use internal rate of return are being irrational. And embedded in that conclusion was the assumption capital always being easily accessible and raisable. So if you believe that there are no capital rationing constraints, of course, you should always pick projects based on NPV. But to the degree that you face capital rationing constraints, why? Because you're a small company, or you're in an emerging market where markets can shut down, or you're a private company, I think it's completely rational to pick an internal rate of return rule because it is the rule that maximizes the bang for your buck. You have limited capital. You want to get the best returns on them. You have to, you have to base an IR. Yes? That's a good question. Should they? In fact, this was a question that was raised last session, too. Because I could, you, tell me how I'll, I'll put it in my discount rate. So I have a schedule of projects. So basically, you keep raising the discount rate till your marginal project has a net present value of zero, right? And that marginal project might have a 16% return, but you've said, look, I know, you know. That's a, so let's say you do that. You end up with a 16% R, a discount cost of capital. It's really not even a cost of capital anymore. It's a cost of capital plus your capital rationing constraint built in. What's the danger of building in capital rationing into your discount rate? I take that 16% discount rate, I use it next year and the year after. Initially, when I'm a high growth company with lots of projects, it's fine. But let's, what, what happens to high growth projects that take lots of great projects? Think of your spreadsheet. They become larger companies with fewer projects. It's the nature of the game. So it's five years later. You're saying, I would have revisited the discount rate. The problem with discount rates is once companies pick them, they just live on and on and on. You forget where they came from. And the answer to why is your hurdle rate 16% becomes? It was here when I got here. My concern with bringing to discount rates is it then gets built in to that hurdle rate. Nobody revisits it. And 10 years later, you're looking at this company, and you know what they're saying? I can't find any projects. 
Of course you can't find any projects. You've set your cost of capital 8% more than it should be. So you end up with companies building up cash. So if you have a capital rationing constraint, we'll talk about what to do. One is to use IRR, because you get the biggest bang for your buck. One is to adapt NPV, and I'll give you a way to adapt NPV. But I think it makes sense for you to look to see what you make on your projects to do it. So we talked about why companies have capital rationing constraints. Some might be because you can't access capital markets, might be private businesses. But in public companies, you know what the most common reason for having a capital rationing constraint is? It's not because you can't access markets. It's not because you can't borrow money. It's self-imposed. I'll give you an example of self-imposed constraints. If you're a high growth company that really can't afford to borrow money and you take a new project and you want to raise capital, how should you raise capital? Debt or equity? We kind of know the intuitive answer. It's a high growth company, a lot of risk. It doesn't have much in cash flows. It should have yeah, equity. So if you can raise the equity and take the project, obviously you're taking a great project. But most companies refuse to do it. They don't want to issue equity, even though that equity is going into a great project. And what's the word that stops them from doing it? It's a bogeyman that every banker uses. There will be dilution. So what? Wouldn't you rather have more shares in a much more valuable company? It's a per share value. But it's amazing how companies, the minute you use the word dilution, stop. We can't raise equity. Why? Because the number of shares will go up. That's a mathematical truth. Of course, the number of shares will go up, but that money is going somewhere, right? Of course, it will create more earnings. It's all about creating more earnings per share. But if you look at constraints and you look at where those constraints come from, they don't always come from outside. They often come from inside. So if you're working with a company and they say they have a capital rationing constraint, don't say oh, nobody has a capital. I read in my corporate finance book that you, that's a guarantee that you'll get thrown out of the office, ask them why there's a capital rationing constraint. Because you want to know whether it's something that comes from an external factor. So if you're an Argentine company and you say, I have a capital constraint, I kind of understand where the constraint comes from. Your capital markets can shut down and you're worried about raising capital. But if you're Google and say, I have a capital rationing constraint, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. The only reason you have a capital rationing constraint is you don't want to issue more shares. So when you think about constraints, think about whether they come from inside or outside, because they come from within. Here's what you need to do. Every constraint has a cost, right? And if you're going to put a constraint, you might as well be aware of the cost. So a board of directors says, we as a company have decided never to issue shares because it dilutes us. So OK, you're the board. You're entitled to make stupid decisions if that's what you want to do. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to value a company without capital rationing constraints, which means I'm going to take every positive net present value project, and then I'm going to revalue the company with the constraint you imposed on me. And I'm going to tell you how much it cost the company last year because you refused. Can you do that? Yeah. In fact, if I, if, I, if I give you a schedule of 15 projects and I give you the net present values, and they range from 5 billion down to 100 million, they're all positive net present value projects. If you had no capital rationing constraint, you'd take all 15 of them, right? But because you put a capital rationing constraint, I stopped at project five. So what have I given up? The net present values of the remaining 10 projects. I'm going to add up those NPVs, and I'm going to give you the bill. This is your cost of imposing this dilution constraint. Are you that attached to it? And if you're still attached to it, you're the board. You can stick with it. But I think we need to let people see the cost of having this artificial constraint put in. of saying, I don't want my share count to change. So if you have capital rationing, I understand. But I want to know whether that capital rationing is coming from within or without, because I want to give you the bill if it's coming from within. And you can decide whether you want to stay with this constraint or not. So let's say you have a capital rationing problem, and you don't like internal rates of return. That original corporate finance class you took stuck with you, where they talked about how bad IRR was. You say, I can't use IRR. I just like NPV. I'll give you a way of cheating the system. The problem with NPV is it's a dollar value. It's going to be higher for bigger projects, right? So if I can somehow take the NPV and scale it to the size of the project, then you have a percentage number that you can compare. In the example that I just gave you, remember the NPV for project one was 467,000. 
and the initial investment is only a million. If I divide the NPV by the investment, I come up with 46.79%. One way to think about it, every dollar I invest in this project creates 47 cents in value for me. If I take project two and do the same percentage, I get only 13.59%. If I want the most bang for my buck, the most dollar value created for every dollar, I can pick the, it's called a profitability index. It's nothing fancy, it's just the NPV divided by initial investment, and you want to go with the highest number you can if you have a capital rationing constraint. So if you have 20 projects, I can compute the NPV of each one, I can take the initial investment of each one, divide the first by the second, and come up with the profitability index for each one, and rank them for you. And so if you don't like IRR, you can go down the ranks of the PI from highest down to lowest and stop when you run out of capital. So there's a way in which we can adapt NPV to make it a percentage return. And there's a reason some people are worried about IRR. And that comes from looking at my third example. I have two projects here. Okay? Again, project A and project B. And essentially, I, they have the same initial investment, so you can't blame differences in scale here. When I do the NPV, it looks like project B is better than project A. But when I look at the IRR, the reverse is true. Here you can't blame differences in scale. You can't say it's time waiting, they're both time weight cash flows. So why am I getting different rankings with NPV as opposed to IRR with these two projects? You're saying timing of the cash flows? Okay, I'm waiting later cash flows more or less than earlier cash But am I not doing that in both approaches? I must be waiting differently in the two approaches. Something must be different about the time waiting that's leading me to different conclusions. Because I'm not computing a return on capital, I'm computing a time-weighted measure with another time. There must be something about the way I'm waiting time that leads me to different answers. What is it? The quantum of the cash flows is very high. Yeah, I know. So, the, so you get high cash flows up front, low later. But I thought all time-weighted cash flow approaches took that into account. So you see what I'm saying? I can see it's a pattern of cash flows, but I'm saying, what is it about the way I'm time-weighting in the two approaches? I'm sorry? The cash flows in between, they have a higher weight. Yeah, but that's again, I mean, I, but why am I getting a higher weight? It must be something in the waiting process, right? What happens to this cash flow in year one? When you do DCF with an NPV, we don't even think about it. I get a $5 million cash flow in year one. Where does it go? It gets reinvested. At what rate? This is where the two approaches give you different, make different assumptions. In the NPV approach, you know what I assume? All those intermediate cash flows are neutral. They get reinvested at the cost of capital. I can't be a value creating machine where I create one great project and it, it, it gives birth to other great projects every year. I essentially said, this is a great project. Wouldn't I get a cash flow in year one? It gets reinvested at the cost of capital. And remember, by definition, if you've done the cost of capital right, it's what you can earn on other projects of equivalent risk. But with the IRR, I'm assuming you can reinvest at whatever the IRR is. You know why private equity investors love internal rates of return? Because when you do internal rates of return, and you tell me the internal rate of return for a private equity investment is 50%. That's incredible, right? And you might not even be lying about the numbers themselves, but you're lying about the 50%, and here's why. This project has a 50% return, but in addition to assuming that, what else are you assuming? That you can come up with new projects in year one, year two, year three, year four, all of which make 50%. That's an extraordinarily dangerous place to be. Because if you count up your money at the end of year 10, you're not going to be delivering a 50% return even if every cash flow came as predicted. Because those intermediate cash flows don't get invested at 50%. Internal rate of return assumes you reinvest at the IRR. NPV assumes you can reinvest at the cost of capital. That reinvestment assumption is basically why you're getting differences. And if you think about which assumption is more dangerous, it's quite clearly the internal rate of return assumption because you're assuming that not only do you have a great project, but you have a fountain of great projects that you can keep going back to, all of which deliver the same internal rate of return as this project. So people have known this about IRR for a while, and there are people who still prefer to stay with IRR. Is there a way I could adapt IRR to take care of this problem? What's the source of my problem? When I get a cash flow in year one, I'm implicitly assuming that I can make 30 40%, right? I could 
be explicit about this and say, I'm going to take the cash flow in year one, and rather than let my approach kind of do an implicit assumption, I'm actually going to assume that I can reinvest at a specific number, and I can reinvest at the cost of capital. What that'll do effectively is it'll let you kind of take care of this reinvestment assumption problem and come up with an internal rate of return that does not require that you reinvest the IRR. So the core of why the two approaches can give you different answers, is even on similar life, similar scale projects, is because of the reinvestment assumption. So here's how this modified internal rate of return will look like. Let's assume you have a project, billion dollars up front, 500 million, 400 million, I'm sorry, 300, 400, 500, and 600 million in the next four years. If I do a traditional IRR, I get 24.89%. But if I use a traditional IRR, I'm also assuming that the 300 million year one gets reinvested at, no. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the cash flow in year one, and rather let, than let my approach implicitly assume, I'm going to explicitly assume that I can reinvest only at the cost of capital. Let's say it's 15%. So my 300 million gets invested at 15% for the remaining three years of the project. My 400 million gets invested at 15% for the remaining two. So I take the intermediate cash flows, and I reinvest them. At the end of the fourth year, I go check my account to see how much I've accumulated with all the intermediate cash flows. I come up with 2,160 million. I have an initial investment of a billion. I'm going to get 2,160 million in the bank at the end of the fourth year. I compute what rate of return would get me from a billion to 2,160 in four years. I come up 21.23%. You think why is it lower? Because if I can reinvest at 15 rather than 24% plus, I'm going to have less money in the bank. The modified internal rate of return reflects it. Again, this is only if you're stuck with IRR and you really want to use it. My, my advice, again, is if IRR is giving you more headaches than it's worth, just let it go. It's a time-weighted cash flow approach. There's another one that will always give you a unique answer, which doesn't have. Yeah? So if you ask me to pick between the two, I feel a little more drawn to NPV than IR, but if you really, really want to stay with IR, I can find a way to adapt it and adjust it so you can still use it without these consequences that come with it. Any questions on NPV versus IR? Okay. Now, why do you think I didn't ask you to compute the IRR for this project? Who's taking the project? Or not taking the project? I'm not going to prejudge you. You could accept or reject. And Whole Foods, but Whole Foods is fully owned by? Um, do you think Amazon is a capital constraint? Has Amazon ever felt a capital constraint? If you're at Amazon, you shouldn't even be looking at IRRs. They're looking at NPVs, not just NPVs, but NPVs over a very long... This is a company with patience built into its DNA. Every project is a 50-year project, and it actually means it. Most companies talk about long-time horizons, but their heart's not in it. They come back to you and say, what have we made in the last year? Amazon really means it. So you can see why at a company like Amazon, it's all about looking at, you know, they might not use an explicit NPV, but the equivalent of NPV over very long periods, it doesn't even make sense to look at an internal rate of return. So the bottom line is NPV, you always get a unique answer. IRR, you can get multiple answers. NPV will bias you towards bigger projects. IR will bias you towards smaller projects. That's neither good nor bad. It depends on whether you're a large company with no capital rationing constraints, in which case you should go with NPV, or a small company or a private company with capital rationing constraints, in which case you should go with IR. NPV assumes you can reinvest at the cost of capital, a more reasonable assumption than IRR, which assumes you can reinvest at the IRR. But if you really want to stay with IR, there's a way of adapting the IRR to make sure your reinvestment assumptions are the same as NPV. That's it. That's basically it. And if you have a standalone project, they're going to need the same answer. It's only when you're picking between projects that you can see. You're ranking projects, you're going to see the NPV and IR give you different answers. But all of that was built on the presumption you were comparing projects with equivalent lives. All three examples, for your lives, right? So now let's talk about projects with different lives. A project A, which is a five-year project, project B is a 10-year project. I've given you the cash flows in both projects. If I compute the NPV of project A, I get 442 million. I compute the NPV of project B, I get 478 million. So based on NPV, project B looks better than project A. Based on IRR, looks like project A is better. 
But here the reason for the difference is not scaling, it's the fact that the first project is shorter and the second project is longer. You no longer get these in the mail, but when we used to actually subscribe to magazines, you used to get these offers. Do you want to renew for one year, two years, or three years? And if it was a sensible magazine, here's how it will work. If you want to renew for one year, it will cost you $20. If you want to renew for two years, it will cost you $38 for two years. If you want to renew for three years, it will cost you $54. Why sensible? I've actually had magazine subscription. We want to renew for one year, it will cost you $20. For two years, it will cost you $42. And three years will cost you 66, and they wonder why nobody takes a two or the three year. Okay. So usually what they're offering is, would you like to pay $20 for one year, $19 for two years, or $18 for three years, a year for three years? And if you just compare those absolute numbers, 18 is lower than 19, and 19 is lower than 20. But you don't need to know present value to know that you can't compare those numbers. So one of the things you face when you have choices with different lives is how do you equalize the process. Okay. So let's think about how we can, e this w in this case I've actually made it easy for you to equalize the process. You see why? Project A is a five year project, project B is a ten year project. So to equalize the process what do you need to do? You could do project A twice. You might not want to, but at least on a hypothetical say what would the net present value be if I made project A have the same life? You think, that's, that's, that should be enough, I'll do that. But what if I'd given you nine year and 13 year projects? How many years would you have to do this? I mean, if you take nine times 13, it's 117 years. I've chosen you know, numbers that, that essentially, there's no other middle number you can pick. So you, can you imagine sitting there on quiz two, projecting cash flows for 117 years? You could get there maybe, but you're going to do nothing else. So I'm going to give you a second approach, which actually is very intuitive. By themselves, NPV is not comparable because it's a lump sum for the project. One very simplistic approach is to take, do what, take the NPV for project 1, divide by 5. Take the NPV for project 2, divide by 10, and pick the higher number. But the problem with that is, if you're looking in a time value space, dividing by five, and you can do that with a magazine subscription. We do that all the time. But in the time value space, having a net present value of 442 million for a five year project is not the equivalent of making 84 million a year because there's a time value for money. See where I'm going to go? You know how you can get the payment from a present value? If you tell me what the net present value is or the present value of something is, what would I have to pay every year for the next five years to get that same net present value? In your calculator, you enter the present value, you enter the discount rate, you enter five, you hit payment, it comes back with a number like 91. It'll be higher than 442 divided by five because you're looking at paying it over five years. It's called an equivalent annuity. Sounds fancy, but I've converted my present value, which is a lump sum number today, into an equivalent annuity. Then I take the second project, I enter the net present value of the project, I enter the discount rate, I enter 10 because it's a 10 year project. Say, give me the annuity I will be making over the next 10 years, and I can come up with an annuity. I can compare those annuities. While I can't compare the present values. So let's try both for this project. First, pro first the, uh, the repli it's called replication. You do project one twice. You remove the lifetime difference problem because they both now have 10 year lives. Just remember when you do project one twice, you've got to come up with an extra billion dollars five years from now and then collect the net present values for the, uh, the cash flows for the next five years. If I take the net present value of project A replicated twice, I come up with 693 million. The net present value of project B replicated twice is 478 million. I can say I'm going to pick the higher net present value. But when you do this, you're implicitly assuming that project A can be redone at the end of year five. That's not a one-time deal. And that might be dangerous, right? You're in a business. Right now, project A looks good, but who knows? Five years from now, you might, might not have anything like project A out there. But that's what replication assumes. The alternative, as I said, is to convert, convert each of these net present values into annuities. So if you look at the 442 million that I'm getting as a net present value, I, my discount rate was 12%. Five years is the life of the first project. I look for the payment button. So that's just you know, my analogy for coming up with the payment that you get. The, net, the payment that I would have is 122.6 million. You're saying, what does that mean? 
Getting 122.6 million for the next five years with a 12% discount rate is equivalent to having a $442 million net present value. On Project B, I do the same thing, but I use a 10-year life. I come up with 84.6 million. How much is Bryce Harper's contract with the Phillies? At least we look, read the day page, 330 million over 13 years, right? If you get a chance, take any of these big contracts, because they're not even a month, right? They, you get a lump sum signing bonus, there's other stuff down the road. Work hard, um, you're, you're not going to feel sorry for Bryce Harper after you do it. But he's not making whatever you get. So let's take the easier number. Manny Machado, 300 million, 10 years. He's doing 300 by 10, making 30 million a year. But in terms of the fact that that 30 million is spread out over time, the annuity that you would need to get to 300 million is a much smaller number. As I said, you're not going to feel sorry. It's still going to be like 25 million, and I think you can live reasonably well with 25 million. But this is something we run into all the time. People like to use nominal amounts added up over time and say, this contract is big. You know what? I can create a $400 million contract for Michael Trout that's actually worth less than the $330 million contract by just moving my cash flows to more towards the back end of the contract. And agents play this game all the time. You know why? Because you get bragging rights. I got the biggest contract. Nobody looks at the present value. Nobody says, Scott Boras, well, how come the present value of your contract was only 253 million? Because we fall for that nominal amount, we fail to factor when the cash flows come in. This is a very simple device for saying, who really has the better contract by converting it to an equivalent annuity. Any questions on different lives? So at this stage, I've kind of laid out all your choices, right? So if you're the CFO of a company, let's say you get to decide which approach you're going to use within your company to pick projects. And I'll give you the choices. You can use some accounting return, return on equity, return on invested capital. You can use payback. It's very simplistic, but he said, look, and I don't like any of these fancy time value approaches. I'll just take projects where I get the cash back earlier. You can use net present value, which comes with the strongest academic credentials, I guess. You know, every book suggests it. You can use internal rate of return. Why? Because you like percentage numbers. Or maybe use a profitability index. So those are your five choices. You see what, which one you choose is going to depend on which company you're CFO of? Okay. So let's say you pick something like this in 2007 based on what kind of, you say, I'm a big company. I don't face any capital rationing constraints. Therefore, I'm going to use net present value. I know this is going back in time. So in 2007, you've adopted this. Sounds sensible, right? Then 2008 happens. You know, remember what happened in October of 2008? GE could not issue commercial paper. At that time, GE was AAA rated. You know, if GE cannot raise commercial paper, do you think you might have some trouble raising capital? I don't care how big you are. You can see how market crises can change approaches. In 2009, I'm sure there are a lot of people looking at payback who never did it before. Probably a lot more companies using internal rate of return than ever before because you start worrying about, I need to make my money back. This is a risky market. One of the things that I think has shifted in economies is 30 years ago, 40 years ago, looked across companies. There are entire segments of markets that were run where companies had nice, predictable earnings, protected markets, and felt pretty good about raising capital for the long term. Today, you look at those companies, they face much more uncertainty about the future. Their technology is shifting, businesses are being disrupted. You can see how people are going to shift towards percentage returns and paybacks a lot more because they're uncertain. So I'm going to leave you at the table. I've not been able to find an update on a shirt, which shows you trend lines in what US CFOs have been doing. So you go back to 1976, 54% were using IRR, 25% were using return on capital or some version of it, and only about 10% were using NPV. You go across 76 to 86, NPV has jumped from 10 to 21%. You say, good, people are getting rational. But take a look at payback. It went from 9 to 19. And that's the most simplistic of approaches, right? So you can't explain this way. So people are getting more sophisticated. That's why it's changing. Because clearly, you're also getting another shift towards something even more simplistic. Why? Because by 1986, people were borrowing more money than they did before. And you see how when you have debt, payback becomes a factor? 
Because with debt, your concern is, do I have the cash flows to service the debt? You're going to be much more inclined towards taking projects that have cash flows up front, if nothing else. So as you look across time, you see the trend lines. The trend lines clearly show an increasing shift towards NPV, but they ebb and flow. Other approaches come and go depending on what's happening in the market, how comfortable you feel about the future. So there's no one approach that's going to be the right approach for every company at every point in time. And you've got to kind of live in the world you're in by looking at the choices you have and say, which one's best for me right now? Okay. Yes? People don't trust accountants. No, that's the reality, is we don't trust accountants. I think it started with the accounting scandals first, and then I think fair value accounting has actually made accountants less trustworthy than before. They thought it would make them more trustworthy. Now we see the, you know, the kinds of numbers moving around. At least, if nothing else, you could look at accounting numbers and say, these guys are slow. But at least they don't go all over the place. Now they're both slow and going all over the place. You get the worst of both worlds. I really don't. I mean, I tell people, look, the one financial statement I no longer even look at is the balance sheet. There's a point where you cared about what's in the balance sheet. It told you how much was invested in the company. Now I look at the balance sheet. I have no idea what this is telling me. So I think it just reflects the fact that we've seen accounting numbers. And it's in a strange way. As they try harder to get more trustworthy, I trust them less because they're trying too hard. Right? Sometimes they might be better off just going back to basics and saying, now, I have three questions I need to answer as an accountant. What did I make last year? What do I own? What do I owe? That's what an original accounting objective was, to answer those three questions. What do I own? That's the income statement. What do I own? It's in the balance sheet. What do I owe? It should be on the side of the balance sheet. But once you start getting more ambition, say, my objective as an accountant is say, what am I worth? What's the value? You've now opened up a question that's actually undercutting your answering the basic questions. So I think the reality is accounting numbers are less trusted. People might use earnings as a metric to price things, but they also realize how quickly earnings can shift. And it's got, a, I think, a negative implication, which is a company like Lyft comes around, you say they lose a billion dollars, and people say, I really don't think they lose money. I've actually talked to people, no, no, they make money. How do you know? I take Lyft all the time. Okay, that would be enough. That makes them go from money losing to money making. But people essentially have said, it doesn't matter whether you have earnings, because those are accounting numbers anyway. The reality is they also have huge negative cash flows, but you don't get to observe them. So I think there's a, there's a downside to this loss of trust as well, is companies with horrific accounting profiles can still get away raising $30 billion in the marketplace. So let's talk about side costs and side benefits. I mean, when you're a big company taking a project, it's almost never going to be a standalone project. Avengers, what's a, what's a, when is it coming out? July, the new, the new Avengers, June 20-something. I've got the date in my calendar. Okay. Okay. You think Avengers is going to be judged just as a movie? Because around the time Avengers is coming out, guess what Disney is planning to do at Disneyland? They're taking California Adventure and they're opening up the Avengers section of the park almost simultaneously. They have a, part, they have a section of the park they've been working on which is going to be just the Marvel section of the park. That movie will create side benefits for Disney, obviously, in terms of perhaps greater attendance at theme parks. I'm planning to go back to Disneyland right after that opens. But also perhaps in merchandising, gaming, etc. Right. So the movie is just the start of the process. You have all these side benefits. And there are also side costs, which is when you have a project it's not like you hire people from the ground to get the project going. If you're an established company, you borrow a guy from that division, two people from that, a warehouse that's being half used. In other words, you use resources as a company you own already. And if you fall into that false argument of we already own it, therefore it's, cheap, therefore it's free, you're going to be taking a lot of projects you shouldn't be taking. So you have side costs and side benefits. So your job when you look at a project is not let them be side costs and side benefits, but bring them into the numbers. So let's start with the notion of an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost is not an explicit cost. It's a cost you create because you took a resource you already owned and used it on a project. You think, what could I have lost by taking? Let's say you own a warehouse building that is only half used. 
or a third utilized, and you decide that you're going to create a new retail arm, and this warehouse is a great place to store the inventory. You already own the warehouse, but here might be your opportunity cost. If you hadn't taken this project, you might have planned to sell the building and move into a smaller facility. It could be that maybe you could have rented out the other two thirds of the building, collected income on it. Or maybe by using up this capacity, you might have to build new capacity earlier. This is starting to sound a little familiar. Don't take too much cues from this. But essentially, when you decide to use something, it is almost never free. There's a consequence. A consequence might be either right now or sometime in the future. And if you're doing an analysis, you've got to bring in your expectations of the cost it'll create for you. So as an example, let's say that Disney owns land in Rio already. If they take this project, they're planning to take that undeveloped land and use it as the base for your hotel that they're going to build. So they already own the land. It cost them five million a few years ago when they bought the land. And if they, if, 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 so if they build a hotel, it's going to become part of the theme park. But if they don't take the project, remember we haven't decided whether to open Rio Disney or not, here's what they plan to do. They plan to sell the land for 40 million. So they own the land already, they bought it for five million. If they take the project, it's going to become part of the project. It's the base for the hotel. If they don't take the project, they're going to sell the land for 40 million. And I want to throw a number in there just in case you need it. The capital gains tax rate is 20%. You ready? You're, you're, you're actually not even looking at that. You're looking at the theme park project. So you're doing the cash flows you saw on the project. I've now thrown this additional piece of information in. Will it affect you? But your original NPV was like 3.3 million, if you 3.3 billion, if you remember. Do you think this might have an effect on that NPV? There's no cash actually being spent, but is there an opportunity cost? What's that opportunity cost going to be? And I'll give you the choices. I could use a five million, the book value saying, I'm trans if you let left with the accountant, that's all they do. They transfer the land from whatever other project was part of into the theme park and charge you the five, five million. That's a book value. Is that a fair assessment of the opportunity cost? Is that my opportunity cost? Not if I define things in terms of cash flows. So what should the opportunity cost be? It'll start at 40 million, right? Because when you sell the land, but you don't get to keep the entire 40 million. Why not? Because when you collect the cash, you've got to pay taxes. Taxes on what? Not the entire 40 million, but the capital gains that you made. And capital gains are defined as the difference between what you paid for something and what you sell it for. In this case, that capital gain is going to be 35 million, 40 minus 5. You're going to pay 20% of that, and you're going to have a 33 million. You're saying, where, where, where am I going to show it? In my initial investment for the theme park, you'll now see an opportunity cost of Rio land, minus 33 million. See what I'm trying to do? I'm saying if you take a lot of resources I already own and use it on this project, I'm going to figure out the cash flow I will lose because you've done this and attach it to your project. So this is an easy scenario where the opportunity cost is right there. I'll tell you what the land is sold for. What if I told you that the land would have been leased out for 10 years and you're going to make $5 million a year? How would your answer be different? You're not selling the land, but if you didn't take this project, you would lease it out. You're going to make $5 million a year. That's pre-tax income. You'd have to apply the tax rate. Take the present value of $3 million a year. At what discount rate? I don't even want to go there, but you know, probably have to use something like an after-tax cost of debt or pre-tax cost of debt because it's lease income. And what you get as a present value will become your opportunity cost. So when you have resources you already own, you can't take the view of, hey, we already own it, therefore it's free. This morning I got an email from somebody in the Brazilian post office. Not a mailman, but somebody who knows me. And he says, we're having a problem in the post office because here's what's happening. First, people keep spending money and hiring people. And then they come to us with a project analysis where they say none of these costs are incremental because they're already sunk. And we're taking every project on the face of the earth. And I said, this is classic bureaucracy at play. The way you make sure you get bigger is you spend the money first, and then you make the decision, because then everything is sunk. And the other thing is that they're taking resources from all over in these projects, and they say, look, we're just using people, your employees already work for us. There's no cost. 
So all these projects look like they have huge cash flows, and I don't think that's right. Something doesn't gel here. And the answer is because you're treating these people as free resources. And if you do that, you're going to take projects you shouldn't be taking. Opportunity cost is your attempt to put a number on those resources you take from other divisions. And that number doesn't have to be an accounting number. It's a cash flow number. So let me at least set up the second case, because we won't have a chance to do it. This is the final project we're going to look at. This is a project that Bookscape, remember that privately owned bookstore, but it's planning to go online. Why? Because that's where people seem to be buying books. So as part of the online retailing venture, here's what they're going to do. They're going, the, the investments they will need to get this process rolling, you know, fresh computers, infrastructure, whatever, is about a million dollars up front. They'll be depreciated straight line over a four-year life. The revenues in, for, in, the year, in year one are expected to be a million and a half, and they'll grow 20% in year two. So basically, the revenues for the next four years are given. The cost of the books you're selling will be about 60%, so your margins are about 40% on the books. The employees who will run the online retailing is going to cost you 150000 a year one, grow 10% a year. Working capital is you know, the inventory you have to maintain. So basically, this looks like a traditional project, upfront investment, cash flows for the next four years. And the tax rate I've given to be 40%. So if I gave you this project, how would you assess it? You take the initial investment of a million, you would project out the revenues, operating income, cash flows, and you will get a cash flow, but you need a discount rate on those cash flows. Now, Bookscape has never done online retailing before. We have a cost to capital for Bookscape as a company, but that's a cost to capital Bookscape as it exists today. This is a new venture in a new business. It's actually even worse than the Disney case because there, at least, you were building a theme park and you already built theme parks. You had some history. They've never done this before. So what do I need to do here? I need to go outside the company. The beta that I used was a beta for online retailers, and I'm going to use a total beta to stay true to the notion of, hey, th this is a private company that are exposed to all risk. With that total beta of 3.02, I get a levered bait of 3.41 and a huge cost of equity, 21.5%, feeding into a cost of capital of 18%. If you remember what the cost of capital was for Bookscape as a traditional company, it's like 12.3%. I'm not using the 12.3% because this is not an extension of the existing business. This is a new business they're entering into, and I have to hold that business to a higher standard before I decide whether to accept it or not. So when you look at discount rates for projects, nothing I give you on the existing company might even be relevant, right? Because it has nothing to do with the existing company. It's a new business, a new project, and you've got to almost build from scratch what that discount rate should be. So I'll end with this. So I projected out the cash flows for the project. So this is like revenues, expenses, taxes. Looks just like the Disney theme park, just a lot simpler because it's a four-year life. At the end of year four, I assume the project was wound up, because I don't know how online retailing will evolve, so assuming a perpetuity seems like a dangerous thing to do. So at the end of the four years, I'm going to just salvage whatever I can get, which in this case is zero, because I depreciate my equipment down to zero. See those cash flows, the second to last line? Those are my cash flows pre-debt on this project, and I'll discount those pr pr cash flows back at my cost of capital for this online venture. What I get is a net present value is 76375 So if I just stop there and say, is this a good investment, what's your answer going to be? Yes. When we come back on Wednesday, after the first 30 minutes of Wednesday's class, we will talk about the case. Don't expect the answer. I will give you my answer. And don't freak out when my answer is different from your answer. But after that, we're going to talk about what can I throw into this project that might change this decision.
case, mm -hmm. right now you haven't mentioned any reinvestment in the world of sports. There's a reason. I didn't mention it. Because when I don't mention something, what is your choice? Assume or ignore? Assume. Which is an assumption that which is Which is an there. assumption. And which one you choose okay. might actually vary depending on which part of the case you're referring. I'll leave it at that. might okay. not be a one-time choice. It might not be a choice you make up front. It might be a choice you make for one particular question, and for another question, you might have to revisit that. There's no, because when you say ignore, assume or ignore, it's not just a spreadsheet choice. It's a choice about whether you want to maintain this project and keep it going. Right, so do I want to renovate at the end of 15 years or every five years? It's not even that. What, is your, what are the two questions in the project? 